Rukim Habayim. This is the Bet Midrash for Parsha Bamibar. Also for the week that precedes Shavuot. So just a few things to keep in mind for schedule. Uh, this week we do have planned an all-night Zoom. So halakhic midnight around our area is about 126 in the morning. So uh, that will be the bulk of our leadership, Bezrat Hashem, for Magin Yishenu being a part of the Zoom. Then uh, those who need to drop off may feel free to do so. And for those valiant warriors who will still uh, press through through the night, uh, no, no shame or uh, shade to anyone who uh, decides, I'm going to go to sleep. That's totally fine. <laughs> But uh, we will have people available via Zoom. Uh, Bezrat Hashem Strictly Torah will be with us, and we will go all night. So we will be using the Ari Zal's Tikkun Leil Shabbat, which is brought by Rabbi Pavanov. May he live and be well. So if you don't have that book, uh, we can get you the information so that you can purchase it. Don't know if you still have time to get it. But uh, if you can, please do so. If not, just be a part of the festivities, have some cheesecake, and then get ready to turn up. So if you have been a part of Rabbi Roskins, may he live and be well, his email communication list, you can see that they're having all sorts of events this week. A little jealous, but excited for them nonetheless. One of the big things they're doing is having an ice cream party. So a few years ago, uh, we decided, the small group of us that were studying all night, we decided to have our own little ice cream party at our house. So uh, I encourage everyone to do an ice cream party. If you can do that, that is something that's totally awesome to do as well. Plenty of coffee, take your breaks, uh, you know, break it up intermittently with whatever stretching and uh, things that you need to do. But just to encourage everyone, we will send out the Zoom link, Bezrat Hashem. Uh, sometime around Havdalah, because there's a special Havdalah to go into Shavuot, it will be over the Kiddush. So that's the way we're going to transition from Shabbat into Shavuot, which is also a Shabbat day, but it's a Yom Tov Shabbat. So that means you can cook on it. So, uh, but other than that, all the Shabbat rules apply. So today... Uh, or tonight, I should say, we're going to switch it up a little bit because I want to get more into Ruth. I also want to get more into um, the Shavuot, like really just everything that's going on with that. And uh, to dovetail just a little piece of uh, the Yerushalayim, the city of Yerushalayim drop that I did not get to share. Uh, also, some beautiful commentaries about uh, what it's like being a convert and how determined uh, we have to be and what we have worked through, what we're working through now and what we are working towards is uh, it's all beautiful. And uh, if anyone has had the opportunity, I really encourage it because it feels like a big shift for the times that we're in. It's called the Geula Summit. And it's hosted by Shifra Hana Hendry with gateofunity.com. So I don't know if anyone knows of who she is, but may she live and be well. She is a, basically a Torah teacher of today. She's a motivational speaker, lots of different things going on. But the reason why I wanted to just take some time to just mention this and encourage everyone to tune in, because Rabbi Trugman Shlita was one of the panelists on there. And many of the speakers bring out such beautiful insights that I think are very transformative, not only to our thinking, but also to our very being. And Rabbi Trugman, what he brought down about the journey of the soul and things like that, and about what we're facing in the world right now, especially preceding the arrival of the Mashiach, very encouraging. It's, it's like it's good to have your marching orders. Because if you don't have a focal point, sometimes it just gets lost, you know, like your way just gets lost in all of the drama and all of the, the hurts and the pains and the heartaches and the sicknesses, which by the way, I got sick over the weekend after Shabbat. So that was 
a doozy, but uh, Brugisham, all better now. That's why my voice sounds like this. So I apologize for it not being uh, completely uh, clear. Hopefully everyone can still comprehend everything. And with that being said, that was my introduction. Let's recite the Birkat HaTorah. So page 16 in your Siddur. And let's give it a little boost. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah. Let's get into the Hebrew. Baruch Ata Aronai Hamlame Torah Leamo Yisrael. Baruch Ata Aronai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol HaAmim, Ve Natan Lanu Et Torato. Baruch Ata Aronai Noten HaTorah, Mashiach Now. Okay, so I want to go ahead and skip down to uh, the Yom Yerushalayim drop which hopefully everyone got a chance to kind of read through uh, the drosh notes. This is from the past Shabbat. Um, so one of the things in there I skipped, it was up top. It is uh, from Rebbe Nachman's Torah, beautiful insights at the very beginning of Parsha Behukotai about the bracha of the Torah, like the blessing that you recite before studying Torah and the importance of that. And so also uh, I was a part of an, an Arab Shabbat Zoom with Strictly Torah. And we talked about the uh, tractate Brakot about the, the sages were having a discussion about saying a Braka before and after you eat and comparing that to the Braka before and after studying Torah, which I was just like, what? You know, like this whole thing about the bread of heaven, the Torah being like manna and the Torah being our spiritual food and nourishment. And it's like, just like we have physical food, we have spiritual food. So we say blessings before and after. And I'm just like, are you serious? But anyway, um, here is what I wanted to share from the future. So just in case anyone uh, hasn't seen the real book, this is a snippet from it. Uh, let me show you the title page. This is uh, this is where we're headed. This book is a modern context on uh, ancient sources about the Mashiach. And it doesn't really give us a, a conclusion of Mashiach, which, by the way, there's not going to be a source that does that. Even the Basora itself doesn't give us conclusive uh, information on the Mashiach. It gives us a lot of things that we need to know. But it says, especially in the writing of Yochanan and John, if we were to try to write it down, books cannot taint it. There's not enough books to do it. So, and they were writing on parchments back then. So, uh, yeah, so that's crazy. But anyway, uh, what is important about this source is that it gives us context. So as we see things play out, we have what I prayed for us all this past Shabbat, the eyes of Mashiach, so that we can see things fall into context. Like we talked about the prophecy of the children of Israel coming in to the land on iron birds. And we were talking about the airplane being the thing and how what that would look like with different uh, airlines saying, you know, who's making Aliyah to Israel? you know, bringing ch Hashem's children home, you know, those kinds of things. It says that the nations will carry us on their shoulders back to our father as a gift. And it's like, instead of being a carry on, why don't I just carry you on with me, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, all these different things. So it says in chapter 11, that Yerushalayim is the spiritual metropolis of the world. That's the title of the chapter. 
What I loved about this is for me, I always think about uh, the, the, the fancy cities of like Atlantis, Wakanda, Asgard, you know, I'm a big comic fan over here. But anyway, uh, I think about all those cities and those are like fragments of Yerushalayim. It's like what Yerushalayim is supposed to be. It's, it's a city that's going to heal. It's a city that's ex that expands. All life flows from it. It is the spiritual light and beacon to all of creation, you know, and so all of the superheroes reside in Yerushalayim, namely the Kohanim, the Leviim, and the Israelites. We're supposed to be a light to the nations, and the tree of life that grows from the flowing river that comes from the throne of Hashem through the temple, that's going to have sprouting and blossoming leaves are going to heal the nations so all of these different things that are going to be an outflow from this holy city and we're already seeing a glimpse of it now in the physical because the way that people are being so drawn to israel and what happens to a person at the coattail wall to be more particular so anyway that's a little drop just on the title so I want to talk about this right here. It says the prophet is telling us that this mountain is different from all other hills and mountains the world over. So, you know, I think of the Manishana, you know, why is tonight different from all other nights? Well, why is the Mount of Jerusalem different from all other mountains? Which, by the way, it even just flashed into my head in the uh, the whole mystical thought of uh, Greek mythology known as the Mount Olympus. I find it very interesting that Yerushalayim is built on a mountain. And if you have seen the temple uh, video where it takes you through the tour and the tunnels and all of that, you see that the actual temple was built on an uneven surface like at the peak of the mountain so that the foundation stone that's sticking out is the tippy top of Mount Moriah. It's like, it's so crazy. But anyway, so it's like, again, all of these sci-fi things, some of them may be more real than not, I guess, I don't know. But all of these give us pictures of what, what are, uh, they're like fragmentations of the actual reality because we should know that the only true reality is Hashem. So therefore, when Hashem sets up his headquarters, places his name somewhere, that's a statement for the ages. If you really think about, like, Hashem, out of all the places in the world you could have put your name, you said right here, Mount Moriah. All of the patriarchs stopped at this place and was just like, this right here, this is the gate of heaven. They didn't say that about any other place. So just a few things there. So it says that throughout history, people have worshipped their idols and false gods upon high mountains and hills. However, once the Mashiach comes, only one mountain will have any status in the world as a place of worship and spiritual growth. And that is Har Moria, Har Hamoria. And it says, the mountain of God. Rashi in his commentary to this verse points out that metaphorically speaking, mountains and hills always represent great miracles that took place on high mountains throughout Jewish history. Think of one of the main ones. It's already right here. Eliyahu, Mount Carmel with the whole prophets of Baal. That was a big thing. Uh, the giving of the Torah 40 days after leaving Mitzrayim which are like 49 days, not 40 days. It took 40 days for Moshe to be on the mountain to get the sapphire tablets. Got a little ahead of myself. Excited. Uh, and by the way, in the Gerula Summit, one of the things that was brought down is that there are uh, healing uh, remedies to all of, uh, or not all, but a lot of our physical ailments, like uh, mental imbalances, uh, physical disabilities of different kinds, that they have found uh, remedies by using crushed sapphire. Now think about that for a second, because 
When did we get healed from the golden calf? When the sapphire tablets were crushed, that was the beginning of our healing. So a whole process ensued after that, but the start of the healing process was the breaking of the tablets, which by the way, is likened to the death of a righteous man or a righteous person. And namely, I always think about Mashiach Yeshua because his body was literally broken for us. No broken bones, but his body was broken. He was pierced, just like the tablets, by the way, were pierced. If you read about the sapphire tablets, it says you can see all the way through them from one side to the other, no matter which way you turn them. And this is one of the coolest things about Mashiach and his resurrected body is he walked around with the holes in his hand and the hold in his side. Even so much so that Teoma, a.k.a. Thomas, was able to stick his hand in there. You know, could you imagine that, you know, we use a Yod to read from the Torah scroll, which Yod is arm or hand. Imagine if instead of using a Yod to read from the Sapphire tablet, we used our hand. It would be like we're sticking our hand into the side of the Mashiach, which, by the way, the Sapphire tablets represented Mashiach. That's why there's two of them. That's why they're the weight of a mikvah. You know, they included the spirit of the law with the letters of the law, and they're the connection that we have through the Zadik to Hashem. They floated, you know, and they were words of life. They suspended death and uh, the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. All of those things were wiped out. The angel of death had no power over us as long as those sapphire tablets were intact. But... They got broken, which, by the way, we were never going to go into exile had those sapphire tablets did not get broken. So had the tablets not been broken, we would have never gone into exile. So it's it's an interesting thing, too, because when we understand Mashiach ben Yosef is not the conclusion of salvation, it's the beginning. He is the beginning. He starts the process of bringing us out of exile taking us out of death into life. And then from that process, we begin to build and build and build, getting a spiritual path ready for Mashiach ben David. You know, it says in the uh, Kol Hator is the source that says, Mashiach ben Yosef only comes to reestablish the Davidic dynasty. So he sets up the throne, as it were, for Mashiach ben David. So he's not trying to do a whole new thing and take off on his own and all this kind of stuff. Follow me. Don't follow all that Jewish stuff. That's not the MO for the Mashiach ben Yosef. So anyway, all of this being said, there's a lot of things that have taken place in the past on the mountains. But when the Mashiach comes, those things are all going to culminate into Yom Yerushalayim. Idolatry being wiped out and all the other high hills and mountains are just lost. They're lost in translation, literally. So as we transition into uh, a beautiful uh, world to come, you know, transitioning out of the Alam Hazeh, transitioning out of exile into Geula, you know, with the New Yerushalayim, the Third Temple, all these different things is just one of the uh, beautiful things we have to anticipate. So I want to go on here. To the next part of chapter 11, it says the prophet Yeshayahu or Yeshaya speaks of the ruins of Yerushalayim that will be rebuilt. As for your ruins and desolations and your devastated land, you will now become crowded with inhabitants and those who devour you will become distanced. Side note, we talked a lot about this on Shabbat, and especially if you've gotten to uh, read any insights and articles on Yom Yerushalayim, you see Yom Yerushalayim now is continuously being filled with inhabitants and is no longer in ruins, i.e. the prophecy of Yeshayahu has already come to pass, come to pass. So living in a time where prophecy is being fulfilled is like outrageous. This is another reason why if you stretch out the timeline and kind of look at a conglomeration of years, maybe a decade or a few decades, you start to see how all of these wheels are turning. But if you're living day to day, it seems like nothing is happening. However, if you just take a look back on, on our life, 
where we were last year versus where we are now, look at how much has happened. Look at how many eyes have been opened to the true Torah of Mashiach and the regrafting in process and pushing away a thousand years of what was that, you know, or 2000 years of what was that? I don't know. You know, at least sometime after the end of the first century, that's when things started to get crazy. But anyway, things are happening. It says Rashi comments on this phenomenon by explaining that Yerushalayim before the advent of the Messianic era is going to be so full of inhabitants that there will not be enough room to build houses for everybody. If you travel to Yerushalayim today, you can't miss the constant building of new apartment buildings all over the city. I travel with students to Yisrael a few times a year, and I'm still astonished by the incredible speed at which beautiful buildings are erected. When just a little while before, all that could be seen there was an empty lot. If you live in Tejas, it is crazy. I almost like want to start mourning for our trees because the plots that you see that are like, oh, look at all this field and meadow, beautiful places for cows to grave. It's like a sign goes up and a construction company comes in and they clear it all out. And you're like, oh, my gosh. So uh, all of these different things that we see in Yerushalayim, like the effects are actually rippling out you know, especially over here and in, in where we live, because it's just like wherever you go, there's construction somewhere. It's like perfectly good highway. Let's rip it up and let's build a new one. It's like, dude, what are you doing? Traffic is already crazy. I don't know. And then the rate of apartment buildings that are getting built, especially here in Texas, I'm like, dude, I don't know what's going on around the world. Maybe everyone could chime in and let me know. But my goodness, if it's anything like what's going on here, we should know that's a ripple effect of the expansion of Yerushalayim. The sages already tell us that Yisrael and Yerushalayim will expand in the future. So much so that the whole entire world will become like Eretz Yisrael. So I don't have that source here in front of me, but that is a thing. And I, I would love to be able to go into that, but let's just end right here with this point that Mashiach, when Mashiach arrives and perhaps in preparation for his imminent arrival, Yerushalayim will be, see, will see a great increase in size. Hence what we just read up here. When Mashiach arrives now, we're talking about his arrival. As one would expect, so of the greatest city in the world, which will be the focus of every nation's attention before and after Mashiach comes. Sleeka, wasn't it just a few years ago that there was a big upheaval because some declaration got made that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel? That, that declaration totally went down. And the whole world was like, am I okay with this or am I not? Hmm, right? And we just talked about here that those who devour you will become distant. So you're already seeing the lines being drawn of like, who's going to recognize Yerushalayim as the greatest city in the world, the capital of Israel, the place that our attention should be focused on, whether people like it or not, they're focused there anyway. Because you still have to focus on a place if you're trying to go attack it and take it away. So in other words, like we're just brimming and overflowing. Like it's, it's outrageous. So that's the first part of class tonight. Yerushalayim. It's going to expand. The other thing that we should know, just because there's seemingly no room, the chapter in, uh, in the future tells us that it's when people start showing up that Jerusalem goes, oh, we need more space? Okay. All right. Here, let me spread out a little bit. Like the city begins to increase. And this was in the Baba Batra drop where it was talking about that uh, the, the city doesn't really have any borders. 
like when it was described in prophecy, it was like, it, it has no boundaries because I don't know how many people are going to show up. And as according to the people that show up, so will be the boundaries. So if we want more space, add more people. All right, Shlomo, get it in. Shalom. Um, I just thought of, I think it's Psalm 104.3, for the Lord has desired Zion. He has desired it to be his dwelling place. And Yerushalayim is included in that, the one place. Um, also, Ezekiel 16 is a very beautiful imagery of how Hashem makes a covenant with Jerusalem and that she was born in the blood, the time of her blood, or Nida, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, so there's some beautiful imagery there. Very nice. Which is also us as well, because that's the picture of us allegorically during Pesach, that as we have blood on our doorposts, we had the the blood of the Pesach lamb, and we also had the blood of the circumcision. So next part, let's go into Shavuot. So again, I'm pulling here from the notes just because I didn't get to go over this on Shabbat, but have a few extra pieces to add to it as well, that uh, there's a book called The Encyclopedia of Jewish Myth, Magic, and Mysticism, second edition. It is written by a rabbi who is local to the DFW Metroplex, which I was like, what? That's crazy. Anyway, uh, it's a great book just to glean. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say like, take everything from this book and run with it, but uh, to give you a greater spectrum of awareness to be aware of. What I love about this book is when you think of things like, okay, what are the Yom Tovim? Like Shavuot, here for instance says, Shavuot translates as weeks. So I don't know if many people know this, but when you mention Shavuot, that's a holiday, but that's the Hebrew name for it. Really in English, it's weeks. And in Greek, they call it Pentecost because of the whole 50-day thing. But really, it's all about weeks. And this actually connects to the halakha. Uh, we count the days. We also count the weeks of the Omer. And in order for us to know when Shavuot occurs, you have to count the Omer. You can't just go out on the calendar and be like, ah, Shavuot's over there. You know, you got to count it out because it's actually the eighth day, so to speak on a more uh, symbolic, mystical level of Pesach. So, so much so that from Pesach to Shavuot, it's considered one big Yom Tov. And the counting of the Omer is known as the intermediate days, aka Chol HaMoed. So it's like we're in a big continuous Yom Tov right now. Then uh, the other thing to mention here, it says uh, an early summer holiday that comes 49 days after pa 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 Passover, aka Pesach, uh, at the conclusion of the Omer, which simultaneously celebrates the barley harvest. Why is the barley harvest so, like, so uh, important? Because what book are we reading right now? What Megillah are we getting ready to read or already starting to read? Ruth. And when, is, when do all of the significant events in Ruth happen? Around the barley harvest. So here's that connection right there. And it's connected to God's giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. Now, what's amazing about this is on the actual day of Shavuot, we didn't really receive anything tangibly. What we did, though, is we heard the voice of the Holy One, blessed is he, according to our ability, which is so important. Or HaKaim is all day on this. I've mentioned uh, Or HaKaim on uh, Exodus 19, 6, and Or HaKaim on Exodus 20, verse 2. And obviously it goes without saying anything between those two passages are also just over the top. So uh, there are recordings that I've uh, shared all this on. Shomo, may he live and be well. Uh, ben Arroyo, he always talks about, oh, there's a man again, uh, or Hakaim, Exodus 19, 6. 
anyway, so you should know it's chock full of amazing uh, information about what actually happened on Shavuot. Next thing I want to mention, uh, Matan Torah is called a chasuna. This is from Torah Wellsprings. And this is from Tani 26, translation of Shir Hashirin 311. Yom which is a wedding day. The day Hashem gave us the Torah. So all of the aspects, customs, halakha of a wedding, which is chasuna in Hebrew, or chatuna, it is a uh, co combination of chatan, which is the groom, and kala, which is the bride. When you put chatan with kala, you get katana. Sounds like a sword, katana sword, <laughs> but chatana. And uh, that's wedding. That all derives from the giving of the Torah. The Torah, giving of the Torah is like a big wedding celebration. So it says that the day Hashem gave us the Torah, therefore many customs of a chatuna resemble matan Torah. Matan is the word for to give, and it's also the root of matana, which means gift. So the Torah was given as a gift. And one of the things that you do at a wedding is you give gifts to the bride. And you also give gifts to the couple in general because one of the big mitzvot of a wedding is to gladden the bride and groom. So there are many accounts of sages who used to do like, uh, for lack of a better terms, party tricks, like they do dances or uh, they sing songs, you know, to bring joy to the couple. And for seven days, we should look for a reason to eat bread so that we can say the seven blessings with the bride and the groom. This is why a Jewish wedding happens for seven days, uh, in antiquity anyway. You celebrate it for seven days. And if you think about the seven brachotes, which is the Sheva brachot, you would have seven sevens, which is like the counting of the Omer and all of the different seven symbolisms that are connected to the time that we're in right now. So anyway, just to bring all these things up. Also, Seder Hayom elaborates on our obligation to attach ourselves to the Torah. Always, always attach yourself to the Torah. He writes, Hashem loves us because of our forefathers and because of his love for the precious, perfect Torah that he implanted in our midst. So before we continue, think about this for a second. We know that our father is Abraham, or our, should I say our forefathers are Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. By fact of that alone, Hashem has already attached himself to us. Hashem goes, you are my people, you are my precious treasure, because you're the children of my precious people, aka Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. That's the three-ply cord that is not easily broken, that has established Hashem back into creation and the oneness of God, the, uh, the monotheism aspect of, of faith was established through the patriarchs. So the Jewish people are known as believers and children of believers. And through our belief, that is the showing of our faith. So we're justified by faith through our belief. We walk it all out. It's like this whole circle thing. So the next part to put on that is the fact that God gave us his Torah. There are many midrashim that break down the fact that since Hashem gave us his Torah, it's like a king be betrothing his daughter to a man and then saying i cannot afford to be apart from my daughter so make a place for me too so in other words if you have the torah you have the presence of hashem with you now obviously we got to break down what does it mean to have the torah because sometimes people have torah but they don't have hashem because they just divorce themselves from faith they just want to uh, isolate themselves with esoteric knowledge get worked up into trances and get spirit guides and 
you know, do things that uh, benefit them. It's called self-aggrandizement. If you are a person who wants to self-aggrandize yourself with the Torah, it actually becomes death to you. Did that which is life become death to me, is the way Paul put it? That's what it's talking about. So we have to understand that it's not just about having the Torah so much as it, how do we have the Torah? Again, connected to the patriarchs and because the Torah was implanted in our midst. It says the Torah is the, here. well, I should have just read this. <laughs> the Torah is the daughter of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the king of kings. Whoever will marry and love his daughter, Hashem will certainly grant him a dowry and a lot of money. Nothing will be lacking. Now, obviously, don't take this literally, but you can understand that there's a lot of richness that Hashem has given us with the Torah. At his right hand are pleasures evermore. Where did the Torah come from? His right hand. So there's a lot to really uh, just kind of go into that, but I just want to stop there. And I read this Akdut uh, passage from Shabbat. So uh, that will conclude that part of class on Shavuot. So let me stop and check in here. I've just been going and haven't gotten to check in with chats. Uh, okay. Cool. So Shlomo Ben David, may he live and be well, is dropping a, some uh, some juice here in the chat thread. <laughs> so I'll take a moment to read it here. Stand by. All right. Another hint to the symmetry existing between the giving of the Torah and the creation of the universe is found in the mathematical structure of the first sentence of the Torah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1, and the sentence introducing the giving of the Ten Commandments on Shavuot, and God spoke all these things saying, Exodus 20, verse 1, each sentence has seven words and 28 letters, alluding to the deep connection between creation and the giving of Torah. Or Hakaim on Exodus 21 says, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, says that the Torah was given in the attributes of chesed and gevura, which, by the way, there's a whole uh, understanding about the, the elements of chesed and gevura and how they relate to the Kohen and the Leviim, uh, and I wish I had that source in front of me to really go into that, but basically, this is beautiful in saying that there's a balance. Hashem didn't just go, Here's everlasting grace with no bounds. Like just here's the beautiful Torah. It doesn't matter if you sin, just go live, have a wonderful life, pick lilies in the, in the field with your friends and just do whatever you want. It's great. Cause that would mean Hashem gave the Torah with chesed and no gevura. but you cannot have true gevura, which is like justice, severity, boundaries. Chesed is your loving kindness. So Hashem didn't also didn't on the flip side go, here's my Torah. If you don't do this, boy, I tell you, lightning bolt's going to be the least of your words. You better get yourself together. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Respect the Torah. You know, like, he didn't do that. He didn't, he didn't just like break it down like that. He gave it in a balanced format. Like, listen, here's life for you. You have the option to choose death. I desire you choose life. Be obedient. We don't really have to go on. But anyway, that's a, a beautiful thing. And when you synthesize, when you bring together a perfect balance of loving kindness, chesed, and strict justice and severity, which is givora or strength, when you bring these two things together, it's, it's known as teferit, balance. This is also known as where the tree of life is. There's balance there. So that's that part. Let's go back to Ruth now. All right, so this is from Benjamin Bleck. Rabbi Benjamin Bleck. Uh, don't know if he is still alive or not, but either way, may he be blessed. It says, the secret of Hebrew words. Ruth came to the Jewish people of her own volition. Here is something that is so crucial about Shavuot. 
if you ever needed any kind of inspiration or pick me up ever, Shabbat is it. Okay, because I don't know how many of you grew up apart from Hebrew, Torah observance, synagogue, uh, lighting Shabbat candles, eating challah. I feel like what in the world, parents, where was this challah when I was a child? It's like we were trying to keep you from being obese. So that's why you didn't have challah as a kid. It's like, OK, all right. Praise the Lord. OK, but anyway, side note, challah is like that's one of the reasons why I converted. I was like, forget cheeseburgers. Look at this. This is bread. Amazing. Anyway, enough about that. Um, so anyway, all of these different things, if you ever grew up just basically divorced from Torah, Judaism, Jewish people living a Jewish lifestyle, if you're, if you grew up apart from that and now you're here, Shavuot is like, sit down in this therapy chair, like breathe in the beautiful aroma of what person that is just like known as Ruth, Ruth. And by the way, Yitro, Jethro, like the, between these two people, like study their lives. Who are they? What backgrounds did they come from? Wow. And they converted to Judaism. They said, ah, you know what? Worldly riches and pleasures. What good is it to gain the whole world and to lose my soul? I'm out on that. I'm going to go over here where life is at. So anyway. This is crucial, which I want to stop right here and switch over to what, uh, what who I like to call Ish Pela, aka Shlomo Ben Arroyo. Keep calling him Ben Arroyo, Ben Hillel. <laughs> Shlomo Ben Hillel, what he shared with me. I'm like, boy, you crazy. Okay, check this out. So, this is from an app called Kayenu. I don't know if anyone knows, it's a free app uh, called Kayenu. So you can see the name right there. So look for that in your local app store. Okay. So let me see if I can make this thing full screen. How do I do that? Uh, zoom in. Oh, now this button works. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Raise the head of the sons of Gershon. Also, they. Uh, this is from this week's Torah portion, if you live in the diaspora. Bamibar. Yisrael is so holy. They studied this last week. We're just now catching up. They're in Parsha Naso now, which I have a Naso drop, Bezrat Hashem, to share from the Midrash Rabbah. Uh, so I'm excited about that one. But anyway, Numbers chapter 4, verse 22. Gershon is related to garage, which means to drive away. The verse can be read. Stop for a second. I forgot to mention this. What happened to Ruth when Naomi was like, okay, my husband died. My two sons died. I have no more money. I am homeless. Let me go back to, yes, yes, she did. She said it, Bethlehem. Naomi was from Bethlehem. So when we look at the birth of the line of the Mashiach, it started in Bethlehem. Because when Ruth and Boaz got together and gave birth to their child, that was in Bethlehem. King David himself was born in Bethlehem. And who else was born in Bethlehem? Mashiach Yeshua. Anyway, the prelude to all of that was Naomi was like, I'm out. Orpa was like, all right, see you later, girl. I, it, it, I can't say it's been fun because there's been a lot of death, but yeah, I'm out. And uh, I'll give you a kiss on the cheek and I'll go away. Ruth, however, was like, ah, no, no, no. You ain't going to get rid of me that easy. I don't care if I got to wait for you to have sons or progeny or whatever. You don't even have to have children. I'm sticking with you. Where you go, I go. What did Naomi do? Girl, get back. Go home. Go follow your sister. Go back to your throne. Did you know that Ruth was a princess of Moab? She was destined to be a queen of this royal city. 
known as Moab, which by the way, this city had so much protection on it that when we were leaving the land of Israel, we were not to attack it. It's like, well, you can go attack Midian, but you better not touch Moab and you better not touch Ammon. So it's just kind of like all these different things. But she was driven away by Naomi and Ruth was like, no, you can't drive me anywhere. You're out of gas. I'm going with you. So anyway, this is the significance of Gershon. It says the verse can be read, raise the head of the sons of those who are driven away. Referring to people who are disliked and feel rejected from their society. The words also they means that they also contribute to their own sense of rejection by harboring a dim view of themselves. My gosh, one of the understatements from the Geula Summit is when you have a dim view of yourself, you welcome sicknesses, plagues into your life. You cover up your connection to Hashem and it's hard to really be intimate with him. It's hard to really hear from him. It's hard to really navigate through these turbulent times. So the better we can be at not looking down on ourselves, speaking negatively about ourselves, and all these different things, the more vibrancy and health and light can be brought into our life. Anyway, side note, we add to our own rejection when we look down on ourselves, think, woe is me, I'm not good enough, I don't know if I can do this, I'm, I don't have the skills, all of those things. We start bringing all those, those are called negative thoughts and negative speech. So negativity doesn't breed positivity. I don't know if people know this, but two wrongs don't necessarily make a right. They make a left. Okay, so it says, this refers to Leah, who was less favored by Yaakov and who had low self-esteem. It was specifically from Leah due to her humble position and self-view. This is what I love about this insight. Not that this is a self-help uh, insight, but even if you do have low self-esteem, you have imbalances in your life and things like that that are going on, you feel oppressed, spiritual attacks, all sorts of things, here's your salvation from that. Apart from well, Yeshua and Torah and Judaism, your shul, your mishpachah, like all the different things that Hashem has offered to us, Baruch Hashem, humble position and self-view. When you are putting yourself in a position of humility and saying, Hashem, I have nothing but you. I'm, I'm, I'm in dire straits. I'm in dire need right now. Psalm 113, what does it say? He lifts up the poor from the dust. Okay, so like all these different things start going on. This will like break through walls. It will bust through the rain clouds and bring sunshine in. But it has to be from a place of humility. This is why when we learn that the Mashiach says, if you are weary and you are burdened, come to me. I am lowly and humble. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. This is why Yeshua is talking like that, because Mashiach is known as the poor one, the humble one. And yes, it's connected to the one who is humble poor, and poor riding on a donkey. And according to uh, Ma or Mar, Secrets of the Redemption that I read from last week, I don't know if you can see this book, but uh, it's from uh, the Torah Classics Library. It's by Rabbi Mordecai Nisim. It talks about that the poor one is actually Mashiach ben David. I'm like, dude, you can't just drop that in there. Like, what are you talking about? Anyway, so because Mashiach ben Yosef is usually known as the poor one riding on the donkey. And if you've read the Zohar, it says, oh, yeah, that's Memtet, who is poor and riding on a donkey. You're like, wait, what? What is going on? Anyway, the whole takeaway from that is humility, releasing your burdens, casting your cares upon Hashem, that kind of thing which is what Leah was actually able to do. How? Because she saw the dynasty of King David and Mashiach. 
She gave birth to the line of kings. She also gave birth to the line of priests. My gosh, you want to talk about being a blessed mother. It's like, oh, don't worry. You're just going to give birth to the future king and the future uh, going adult. Like just small things, you know, don't worry. It's no little thing. Just, you know, just keep crying. It's okay. It's like, uh, what? And then not only that, she had the biggest portion of the sons of Yaakov. It's just like, wow. So again, a, a point to be fixed and focused on is, is, is very, very important. Such divine greatness can be born only from a source of extreme humility. This is also alluded to in the Torah's laws of inheritance. When a man has two wives, one liked and one rejected, this refers to Yaakov's two wives, Raquel and Leah. The firstborn son will be to the rejected one. This refers to King Mashiach from Kisphod Ha'ephod. Side note, Leah was considered rejected, but the son who was considered the firstborn, which namely is the Mashiach a long way down the line, because the Midrash Rabbah tells us, Hashem says, I make Mashiach a firstborn. He comes from Judah, which is the son of Leah, and Leah was considered the rejected one. So even though there's a whole battle for the firstborn, which ultimately we know out of the 12 sons of Yaakov, it was Yosef, but still Reuben had to have a portion. And then again, the whole aspect of Judah uh, rising up, the, being the leader among the brothers and the whole episode with bringing the family back together during Parsha Vayigash, which is uh, one of the latter Torah portions of Genesis. So the Mashiach came from the one who was rejected, is that. Okay, so I know I'm kind of going crazy over here, but uh, that's what I wanted to share there. So let's go back to the secret of the Hebrew letters. Here we go. Uh, this goes on to say the Torah was given in the desert, not in the, well, we'll go back. The book named after her is read on Shavuot, the festival of the giving of the Torah. So when we celebrate Shavuot, we read the book of Ruth named after Ruth. <clears throat> so it says the Torah was given in the desert, not in the land of Israel, because it was meant not simply for the Jewish people but for humanity as a whole. This is one of the crazy parts that religion is doing so much damage to us on right now, is we forget we as mankind used to walk in oneness. Remember this time before the Tower of Babel, where everyone spoke Hebrew to the point that they were able to build an inner, or I don't know, multidimensional edifice that can literally take us into heaven so that we could think that we could fight with God and his angels, which by the way, I don't, I don't know what we were thinking as mankind thinking, oh, Tower of Babel, we don't want to get flooded anymore. So we're going to go up to a ship and just let him know. It's just like, dude, it can turn you into a greasy spot. But anyway, Hashem was like, wow, I give you unity. I give you truth. And this is what you do with it. However, uh, I should wipe you out, but I'm not because you're completely unified in this. And I'd rather you be in unity than like warring with each other. So let me just scramble your language and spread you out. Like I told you to in the first place, I told you spread out. Noah's first son takes this portion. Second son, take that portion. Third son, take that portion. Split the world into three. Go do the whole thing I told you in Genesis chapter one and two. Like, get busy. We're like, nah, we saw the flood of Noah. We don't want that anymore. We want to be disobedient and we want to safeguard our disobedience. So we're going to build a tower and we're going to let you know a piece of our mind. Anyway, that was life and reality before the Tower of Babel, scrambling us up to make religions, uh, races, uh, nations and civilizations that are oh so contrary to God, a lot of them. And 
On top of that, Hashem's truth is hidden in it. This is why no matter what faith system or people group or language you go and visit, there's some fine thread of truth in Torah there. This is another part that makes the Geula Summit so beautiful as a lot of the speakers that Schiffer's bringing out, I'm like, girl, are you sure? Because I don't know about this, you know, but it's like, no, Torah and redemption is for everyone. Remember, Hashem was totally like, I'm going to take Dathan and Aviram out of Egypt. Dathan and Aviram, like the number one troublemakers, every time they hear Hashem say, don't do this, they're like, oh yeah, let's do it. Anybody else want to join us? Hashem was like, all right, come on out of Egypt. I know you're going to be just so disrespectful to my face. So again, Hashem is going to bring redemption to everyone. So these speakers are bringing down all of these things. And in the midst of the speakers, we have, you know, Rabbi Truckman, we have Rabbi uh, Jacobson, we have Rabbi Gersh, we have Rabbi uh, Kotz, you know, like, so many different Torah teachers to balance it all out. And when you look at the full tapestry, you can see that even the speakers who don't consider themselves Jewish or Torah observant, they still have the truth of Hashem in them and it's able to be brought into alignment. And it's not like, yeah, re reject the Torah all day. It's, it's not that. There's a whole thing where people have to learn the ways of Hashem, which is what we talked about last Shabbat. And that's happening. One of the other parts about this is the fact that these teachers who are not necessarily Jewish and Torah observant, they're brought into a medium of communication that says, this is the Torah, this is the Shabbat, this is the Jewish people, this is Judaism. And they're getting exposed to this in like in in-depth ways, complete sources and all these things. So that which has divided us is now being broken down. We're finally able to see how we can actually integrate part of the understanding of mankind coming back together as one for the final redemption with the third temple because it's a house of prayer for what? All people. Everybody is welcome to come to the temple. Hashem is like, I'm not closing the door. Let them come in. Their idolatry will be checked because once Mashiach arrives, the scales are going to fall off of eyes, just like they fell off of Shaul's eyes. Paul's eyes had fish scales on them. He couldn't really see, even though he proclaimed to know like all these beautiful Torah drops. But there was something he was lacking. And that's happening on so many levels right now. Even us, Magi Yishenu, Strictly Torah, anyone else who's following Yeshua, we're still lacking things. And we have a quantum leap, as it were, that we're going to go through. Big downloads that are going to happen. And it's not like we're wrong right now. It's just like we just are missing information. And that's all going to be revealed. Even the Talmud brings down their open arguments in the Talmud. There's no conclusion to some of the halakhic conversations. And they say, well, we will find out what the final answer is, what is the resolution when Eliyahu arrives, which by the way, Eliyahu arrives, shows us who the Mashiach is, and then we go from there. And it's like, we start figuring out who's in what tribe, we start figuring out who goes where in the land, like it gets amazingly ridiculous. So anyway, all of that being said, when we look at the fact of coming to the truth, being like Ruth, being like Jethro, every person who really undergoes this, it's outrageous. Jethro left his life as like a, a master of uh, idolatrous faiths. He was a priest of Midian, which I don't even want to research what that means. And he was just like, yep, yeah, I'll give that up and I'll go join the Jewish people. Ruth was like, I'm a princess, you know, the Frozen movie, like, that's me, girl, I got you, she's like, yeah, I'll give that up, I'll go, I'll go follow Naomi, girl ain't got no shoes or nothing, it's like, yeah, I'm going there, and I was talking about this to my co-worker today, and he was like, you know what verse I'm thinking about, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom, or should we say rich woman, because that's the thing, 
How hard is it for a rich person to enter into the kingdom? Ruth was that. She had no lack. Moab was rolling in the dough, as they say. She didn't, she didn't have to worry about any of that. And she was just like, yep, I'll give it up. So anyway, uh, Mashiach speaks to us on these things. He basically leads out with insights telling us with man, it seems impossible. But with Hashem, all things are possible. And this is why we have to understand when we give people access to Hashem, let Hashem and that person have their relationship and watch what happens. Could you imagine where you are now? Like, say, for instance, if you go back to the starting point, whatever first piqued your interest in Torah, if someone jumped in the middle of you and Hashem, like communicating and was like, yeah, 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 don't listen to God. Listen to me. I want you to do this, this, this. I need you to dress like this. I need you to eat like this. You know, somebody just came and just gave you the whole rundown. They never gave you a chance to really connect with Hashem. They never told you to take your sidur, sit down, meditate, put all your planning and activities aside, spend some time with Hashem, cry out to Hashem in prayer over the things you're confused about, cry, over to, cry to Hashem over the things that you're frustrated about. I listened to a pastor lie to me for how many years? My mother did this, my grandma, all that, like Hashem, what? You know, imagine if someone took that time from you. They took those opportunities of connection to Hashem from you. Where would you be right now? The worst thing we could do is live someone else's Judaism. And that's another part here about Ruth and Jethro is that they did not live someone else's Judaism. They had an encounter with Hashem. And when people come to the temple, the third temple, when Mashiach arrives, people are going to encounter Hashem. And from that standpoint, that's where all of this, all the things happen. Yes, we want to be there to support. Yes, we want to encourage. Yes, we want to teach. Yes, we want to shepherd. Oh my gosh, look out for the pitfalls, all of this. But my gosh, let them and Hashem sit down and watch what happens. And that's the power of Ruth. Ruth had an encounter with Hashem. And here's the other thing. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Moshe, I believe it's Gertsch, uh, he said it. And uh, let me check my note real quick. It is, he's one of the speakers on the summit. One second. Here it is right here. Rabbi Moshe Gerst. G-E-R. S-H-T. Boy, talk about a hard last name. Anyway, uh, he was bringing down the, uh, let me just read it. It's from the Baal Shem Tov. Check this out. I was like, bro, did you get that out of the Basora? He says, the Baal Shem Tov mentioned Mashiach must come to you first for Geula, for redemption. For you and then for the rest of the world, you have to have the Mashiach internally, and that's what brings the Mashiach to the external reality. I was like, bro, what? You remember this whole time while Mashiach was walking around, he went to people was like, don't tell anybody about this. It's not time for me to be revealed yet. Wait till the resurrection before you start sharing all this stuff. This is just me and you right now. So that's the thing. Redemption starts with us. Mashiach starts with us. Are we experiencing Mashiach? Have we encountered it? Have we understood redemption? Are we entering into it? And then it's going to manifest outside in the world. The secret of if you want to change the world, change yourself. Uh, that is by far an understatement to this whole thing. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. So the Jews... We're not so much the chosen people as the choosing people. Get that? Hashem says, Asher Bachar Banu, like from all the peoples he has selected us and gave us his Torah. And we say this in the opening blessing of studying Torah. But it's not so much that we're chosen as much that we chose him. Because remember, 
This is in the Or HaKaim on Deuteronomy chapter 33. Hashem went around to all the nations of the world, said, will you set my tour? Will you set my tour? You want to be with me? Come on. Where are you at? And they're all like, uh, what's in the Torah? What is this? What's a Hashem? What are you talking about? It says, well, it says you shouldn't do this. No, uh, no, 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 I can't do it. You know, like it's a bad dinner plate or something like, uh, what is that? Oh, no, no, no. That's gross. Brussels sprouts. Ugh, you know, and Jews. It was offered to us and we said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't even tell us what's in it. We're going to do it anyway. We'll we'll learn it, read it later. We're just going to do it. Hashem was like, wait, what? Uh, angels, bring on the crowns, you know, clothe these people. That's Shavuot, by the way, not a Seb and Ishma. We will do and we will hear. Okay, so anyway, that's the beauty of this. And it says, when all other nations refuse, okay, again, there it is. All right, so you probably already read that. Let me get to the point. So in the book, the, the Secrets of the Hebrew Words, this whole section's in there, and it breaks down Ruth's name. So Ruth is a resh, a vav, and a tav, which, by the way, if you spell it backwards, tav, vav, resh, you get the word tour, which is turtle dove which is what the Mashiach is called. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. That's a whole thing about things that occur in the land of Israel before the Mashiach arrives. You want to know what one of them is? Rebuilding of cities, the expanding of Jerusalem, uh, blossoming of plants and vegetation. Has not all that started happening? Okay, anyway, we're so close. Mashiach now. Okay, anyway, the other part, Tav, Bob, Resh. If you add the letter hey on the end, it becomes the word Torah. So the, the first three letters of Ruth's name are connected to the first three letters of the word Torah. So much so that it's like Ruth connected herself to the letter hey. And when she did so, she became Torah. Ruth becomes Torah when it's connected to hey. And He is uh, the Hebrew letter that's connected to spirit, breath, five books of Torah. It's also related to repentance. So when Ruth repented, she joined herself, as it were, to the Torah. It says, this is, in fact, key to her greatness. Born a non-Jew, and as the Encyclopedia of Biblical Personalities brought down, Ruth had a different name before Ruth. So when she converted, she took on the name Ruth. I have yet to see what her, her uh, Gentile name was, so I don't know. But anyway, it says she was responsible only for the seven universal laws. This is called Noahide laws. So at Magin Yeshenu, we encourage everyone to really take all of the concepts that you hear taught in Judaism, like reincarnation, Noahide laws. Uh, those are just a few things that come to my head right now. We encourage you to like explore them in depth. Again, take them to Hashem. Hashem, what's up with this? Why is this a thing? Because I can't just tell you definitively a yes or no. But what I can tell you is my perspective on the matter. And what I encourage everyone at Magi Yashenu in. So this is how I feel about Noahidism. You ready? Ruth Gematria 606. The letter Resh equals 200. The letter Vav equals six. The letter Tav equals 400. She desired not simply the Noahide laws, but all 613. Here's the thing. There are so many different sources that can be brought down about Noahide laws, whether for it or against it. But the thing is, are you desirous of Hashem's Torah or not at the end of the day? Because the thing is, it says, and so Ruth took upon herself the additional 606 laws. Her name means I was under uh the the uh the ruling or the uh the obligation if you will to follow seven of the Torah's 613 laws my name ruth equals 606 when you add 606 plus seven it equals 613 she goes you know what seven give me all of it 
which by the way, the whole Torah is summed up in one commandment. And it's actually nothing you actually do. It's actually what you set yourself up for. It's called Shema Yisrael. And you cover your eyes while you recite this. It's the daily declaration we recite two times a day at least. That's the whole Torah. Another way the whole Torah is summed up, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So Ruth was like, seven? What's a mere seven? So anyway, if you want to take on Noahides, there you go. Which I should tell you that one of the original Bezrat Hashem intentions of offering the seven Noahide laws was to give people a base to start from. Just like Acts chapter 15, people were given a base to start from. It's like the, you don't know Hashem? You ever heard of the Torah? You ever heard of the Shabbat? Well, why don't you just come on in and we'll tell you. Here's a few things to keep you safe along the way. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Uh, try to focus on that and maybe start working on that. Other than that, let's go. When you go to a water park, when you ride a roller coaster, what in the world do they tell you? All of the safety precautions, give you some protocol, give you some boundaries, give you some things to do to help it be more exciting. That's like one of the things with the Noah Heights is a lead in, like, where are you going with the shim? So her name reflects that number, a divine commandment, or uh, the number of divine commandments that she voluntarily and here it is, joyfully added to her commitment. Here's another thing. When people understand that there are 613 commandments, some people freak out and they like turtle shell. They like head go in the clothes, try to hide, run away. I don't ever want to hear from you again. Like what? Like they freak out. They panic, have uh, panic attacks. Where's the brown paper bag? Like Sheldon from uh, Big Bang Theory. Like I can't breathe. Like what's going on? Anyway, but it's like, okay, just easy. Here's a couple of things. Just don't do this. Take your time. Get to know Hashem. Once you get to know Hashem, everything seems to work out for some reason. Anyway, so that's a little drop there. So that's that section of class on Ruth. Well, at least from the notes. How's everybody doing? Uh, there's a hand up. Okay. <laughs> Shlomo, what you got, bro? I had a thought on the Tower of Babel and then this week's Parsha, Bamidbar. Okay. Now, um, Nimrod wanted to gather everyone under one place, right? He wanted dominion over everything. Yes. And so in an act of arrogance, he shoots an arrow, so to speak, up into heaven. And Hashem says nothing will be held back from them that they have imagined to do. And thus they are all scattered. But now we come to the giving of the Torah and this week's Parsha, Bamidbar, where Israel saw the encampment of the angels around the Kisei Kavod, the throne of glory. And they said, we want to be arranged like that. Love it. And the Holy One, blessed be he, says, absolutely, do it. And they arranged themselves. Wow. And then the Orkaim statement that everything is subordinate to the Shekinah because it is the place that is with him. Wow. Beautiful. This is the whole thing about the banners. Like when we read about how we encamped, like we see in the Torah portion, which is another beautiful shout out to the chastity of the nation of Israel, that we're able to know our lineage. We know who our parents are. We're connected to our parents. Now, we live in a, in a broken world for sure. And there's a lot of us who have to deal with not growing up with our parents due to maybe death, chasme shalom, or, you know, some, some have had that, you know, and may their memories be for a blessing. Or, you know, there's been parents who just like, you know what, I'm out. I don't, I don't want to raise this child. And they drop you off somewhere. You know, uh, I am a child of, you know, my dad wasn't with me as a child and I spent weeks or uh, I spent uh, 
weeks and days, you know, waiting for him in the window and he never showed up. Think about how scarring that is to a young man, you know, and it's just kind of like, wow, you know, but in this parsha this week, we see our families, we see the power of that, we see our place, you know, um, the incredible Talmud, may he live and be well, is one of our Avengers, aka Mikhail Nicholson. This is his Torah portion. It's also Shira's Torah portion. Kola, may she live and be well. Uh, it talks about how you find your place, your order in creation in this week's Torah portion. It's like this beautiful uh, concept. And in uh, the conversation I was having with Mikael, we were talking about the fact that 248, that's Avraham. And Abraham is our father. When we come into Torah, we come grafted into the family. We now have a dad. We know who our dad is, which is powerful. Think about who Abraham was. Anyone would be like just so blessed to literally be his child. Like, could you imagine Father Abraham raising you up from a baby? Like, what is that? You know, and that's what we have as the Jewish people. But anyway, he was bringing that up about 248 Abraham, your place, your family. And I was like, there's a source somewhere that mentions that there are like 248 columns or around that number, depending on the Torah scroll, that a Torah scroll consists of 248 columns of Hebrew text of the Torah portions. So the five books of Torah written on parchment, ends up on a scroll of a kosher animal that was sacrificed. And there's about 248 columns in there. And in those columns, they feature what is known as a Torah portion. Everyone is born into a particular Torah portion. So when you find your Torah portion, you find your place in the family is what happens. And it's, it's this beautiful thing that when you know you have a loving family. You have people that have gone before you and that are coming after you. And what you do is meaningful. You matter to someone. How much does that change your life? How much does that change the way you think? How much does that change the way you act? You know, and so these are some of the few things we learn in this Torah portion. So I want to read from uh, the book of Ruth from the Art Scroll Tanakh series. I don't know if uh, anyone has this source, but I want to go here to the uh, the push away chapter, chapter one, and I want to pick up around verse 17. So it says, where you die, I will die where you are and there I will be buried. Thus may Hashem do to me and more if anything but death separates me from you. So this is Ruth chapter one, starting at verse 17. And it says, when she saw she was determined to go with her, she stopped arguing with her. See, here's the thing. If you are like a person who is a convert or you're just checking out Judaism or you're like, people don't know you and you're like trying to look in and see what's going on, you are what's known as sus. Like, i.e., like, what are you doing here? What are you trying to accomplish? Are you really in or are you out? I'm not sure because the whole history of nations and Judaism hasn't been so pretty. It's like, well, I'm sorry to tell you, times have changed. Well, no, I'm happy to tell you, times have changed. People don't just want to go kill Jews anymore. People want, to, well, there's still pockets of that in the world. Bezrat Hashem, it gets erased and blotted out because the best way to end anti-Semitism is teach Torah to the nations. Well, guess what? There's a lot more of the nations going, uh, yeah, teach me some Torah. Come on, man. Are you scared? You know, like you got to kind of be a little hype about it. But either way, no matter where you fall in the spectrum, there's arguing that kind of happens like, I'm not so sure. It's like they want to see some proof. You know, my Haruta was looking at me like our first meeting, like, OK, so there's a lot of obvious things about you, sir, Amet, that, uh, 
you know, not to judge a book by its cover, but uh, based off of what you told me about your background and uh, how you live now and what's going on now, uh, well, and then we started learning together and it's just like, oh, well, go on, tell me more, you know, and this is the thing. This is what we have to do. You have to be just like Ruth, just like Yitro. It's like, Argue with me all day if you want, but are we going to dive? Are we going to study the parsha? Are we going to engage in halakha? You start talking like that, you start really walking in those things, mouths just close and eyes just open and books open. And it's just like, okay, well, I was wrong about you. I'm not going to apologize twice. I'm sorry. What was that? told you I'm not apologizing, you know, those kinds of things. Anyway, being a little crazy, but seriously, we have to like, we got to push through some things. We got to fight. And, and we have Shavuot that teaches us this. So check this out on uh, the arguing here. Okay. So the two of them went on and this is verse 19. And the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. I just love hearing that. They, they went to Bethlehem. They left the place of exile and came to Bethlehem. It's like, wow. Okay. Anyway, so two of them went on. The commentary says, and they went, the two of them. See how precious proselytes are to God, aka converts. From this verse, we can see how precious we are to Hashem. Sometimes that doesn't translate to the human mind. Sometimes we read in the Torah, Torah says God loves converts. And then you get in human interactions like, we don't love converts. You're not welcome to our shul. I'm sorry, you're out. Mm -mm, nope. And guess what? It's like, well, have you heard about Strictly Torah? Have you heard about Magin Shainu? It's probably more of us, but these are the people I know about. And it's like, well, come on in. We'll welcome you. And uh the temple, when it gets here, it's going to welcome you. Mashiach welcomes you. So I'm just saying, you're in good company. But God says we're precious. Number one, we learn it from a verse about a convert who overcame an argument by her actions. She wasn't trying to, to uh, debate Naomi into, Naomi, sorry, I don't care what you say. You got to listen to me now. It's like, no, I'm going with you. So. Push me away if you want. It says, see how precious proselytes are to God. Once she decided to convert, scriptures ranked her equally with Naomi. There is a statement from the sages that says, a convert is a full Jew in every right. We are equal status with the Jewish people. You should know this. The next part is, it says the two of them, which is the Hebrew word shetahim. And it says this word, the two of them, is mentioned to stress the determination of Ruth. I ask you, are you determined? You know, we're counting the Omer right now, and it's known as ascending the mountain, ascending to receive the Torah. When we make Aliyah to Yerushalayim, we have to ascend a mountain. Part of the Baba Batra 75 B drop uh, says that people will tire in the time to come because Jerusalem is going to be lifted up so high that they're going to be like, I cannot physically climb the mountain. I cannot make it there. Jerusalem is so high up that I'm just like, I'm fatigued. I can't do it. And Hashem is like, once you're ready to give up, that's when I'm here for you. It's a supernatural thing to ascend. It's a supernatural thing to make it through the Omer count. You have to have some determination. You have to have some Hashem help me uh, statements happen. Okay. So this is Ruth, the two of them. She was determined who, although she was leaving her home, get this, leaving her home, her birthplace, and her kindred, what does that sound like? Has anyone ever read Parsha Lech Lecha, which is Genesis chapter 12 about 
Abraham leaving Haran and coming into the land of Israel. It says you're to come away from your house, come away from your father's house, you know, come away from your land, all of that. Abraham, by the way, was a very big deal where he came from. He was very famous. He stood up to a little known king known as Nimrod, who, by the way, was like, Abraham, if you don't bow before me, boy, and renounce your God, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. You know, the same furnace that Hananiah, Mishael, and Hananiah were thrown into. Hananiah, yeah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Sika, aka uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, those three, the Hebrew boys that were thrown into the furnace by uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Well, that already happened with Nimrod throwing Abraham into the furnace. So Abraham survived the furnace, which means, Nimrod, you're not as big of a deity as you say you are. You're like Thanos in Avengers Endgame after you got turned into dust. Like, nobody's scared of you. And who's this Abraham's God? Like, we want to know him now. Who is he? And Hashem was like, all right, well, I need you to come follow me now. And he's like, all right, Sarah, it's time to go. And Sarah's like, where are we going? Hashem, and, and Abraham was like, wherever Hashem tells us. Can you think about that for a second? Leave your solitude, leave your place of belonging and come after me. Who does that sound like? Mashiach Yeshua. Let me go ahead and read this passage from Mashiach Yeshua. Uh, where did I put this note? Did I put it in my notes? I put it in my notes. Yeah. I took this down today because I was like so excited about this whole drop where Mashiach was telling us about the rich person entering into the kingdom. This is in Matthew chapter 19, verses 20 through 30. Uh, let me go to somewhere on the webs with a Bible I can portray on the screen. Matthew 19. Uh, chapter 19. It'll be a crazy version. So let me just suffice with the complete Jewish version. How about that? Do they even have that on here? Biblehub.com? I don't know if they have it anymore. Nope, they sure don't. All right, good old New American Standard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep it old school. <laughs> okay, sorry, y'all. All right, here we go. So check this out. So where, where does this at? Matthew 19, 23. Okay. 19, 23. Wow, this is Genesis. I need Matthew, please. <laughs> here we go. Now we're cooking with oil. Holy oil. Okay. And Yeshua said to his Talmudim, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man or woman to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which by the way, a big rope can fit through the eye of a needle. How? You have to unwind the rope. You have to give up all your possessions, like your fame, your belonging, your place. <laughs> okay, it says, then for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the Talmudim heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? Note that being saved is entering into the kingdom. Okay, so there's a lot about what the kingdom of Hashem is. That's a topic for another time. But just know it's deeper than just having a belief, you know, in the Mashiach. It's much more than that. It says, and looking at them, Yeshua said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Here's the point of bringing this up. Verse 27, then Kepha, which is known as Peter, Shimon, said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. 
what then will there be for us? And Yeshua said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, which by the way, the regeneration, the resurrection, post-resurrection, throne of David type stuff, when that occurs, you shall sit upon 12 thrones. He's speaking particularly to his disciples. And it says, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Big statement. It says, and everyone who has left houses, here's where it applies to us. Everyone who has left houses, brothers or sisters, father or mother, children or farms for my sake, for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is mentioning to us that in the world to come, that, you know, there is, all right, Lala Tov, I'm not sure who iPhone is, but Toda Okay, but yes, um, in the world to come, people who are on top, like, you know, people who are doing evil and prospering and, and things like that, like they're the wicked people who are prospering, those kinds of things, people who are exalting themselves and pushing Hashem away, those people may seem to be on top of the world now, but in the world to come, things will change. So just a little uh, information to what is promised to us when we give up things. So going on to say that she marched on with the same strength of soul and purpose as Naomi. Also, they went, the two of them, just the two of them alone. They didn't even wait for a caravan. So I want to go back a few Shabbats ago where I was talking about the pilgrimage to the temple. Because the, the festival of Pesach, the festival of Shavuot, and the festival of Sukkot are each holidays where we actually are supposed to travel to the temple. All Jewish men who are uh, of age, which is uh, bar mitzvah and above, or 20 is the age of accountability and above, you're supposed to go make aliyah to the temple. The thing is, is you're traveling so far that you're in a caravan. You're in, with a group of people. There are other people leaving their homes to go to Yerushalayim. So the story in the Basura where Yeshua was left at the temple and his parents had to come back and they were like, where were you? He's like, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Well, when you put together the logistics of their trip, they lived in Nazareth in the Galilee. So like however far that is from the temple, they had to basically add to their travel time. So I can only imagine with uh, Naomi and Ruth, two women who were poor and destitute at this point, leaving from Moab to go back to Bethlehem, that's kind of a little dangerous, a little precarious, you know, and they're traveling together. So it goes on to say the all she deduces from the fact that Shetehim, the two of them, ends with the masculine mem instead of the feminine noon that the two were afraid to travel the dangerous roads of moab alone and they distinct and they disguised themselves as men ad boana bet lechem which is until they reach bethlehem at the time which they discarded their disguises Wow, all Sheik brings down that, okay, obviously this is dangerous, two poor women traveling alone. Well, if you look at the text, it actually alludes to the fact that they actually disguised themselves. They dressed as men to keep themselves safe. So this is that time where the movie of Mulan just comes right in with a roundhouse kick and was like, remember that time there was a lady who dressed up like a man so she could save her family? You know, like, there you go. Anyway. So that's that. And then it says the journey to Bethlehem was a profound emotional experience for Naomi. She recalled the scenery and paths that had once been her own 
in which she and Elimelech had re had renounced 10 years earlier. So here's the crazy part. So Ruth is going through a big transition, a big transformation, and Naomi is reliving uh, painful memories simultaneously. Ruth is in a state of joy. Naomi is in a state of brokenness and sadness. We've mentioned this multiple times that the Zohar brings down one part of my heart is crying and, and uh, pain and sadness. And the other part the other half of my heart is crying and joy and exuberance. And so this is the full spectrum that we're called to be in at all times. If we really live in a life with Hashem, that there's going to be the ups and downs is the full spectrum of happiness and gladness. It's a time for joy the time to mourn, you know, all of those brought down in Ecclesiastes. So when you think about these things, so Naomi is seeing this because this same path she is taking is the one that she took previously when she said, you know what, forget the land, forget living in Israel. Like, I don't want to be here. I'm going to go to Moab. I'm going to go be with people who are idolatrous. And now she's having to come back. And this is her teshuva as well. So we can see that there's actually multiple facets to teshuva. Part of it is we're excited to return to God, but part of it's like we're so hurt for the things that we once rejected, the things we once renounced. And Bezrat Hashem, as we're counting the Elmer, these are some of the things that we're dealing with right now. Hashem, there are places in my life where I push you out. I spend more leisure time than I do study or prayer time or time to meditate, time to go be out in nature, go be with my family, you know, all these different things. These Omer counts are helping us deal with character flaws and things that we need to rectify and refine within ourselves so that we're ready to encounter Hashem. Because if Naomi or Ruth didn't deal with these things on the road, they would not have been prepared to engage with Boaz. So that's why I'll end it there for that. And then let us go ahead and count the Omer and uh, we'll conclude with the Midrash Rabbah on Parsha Naso. So I'm going to bring up the counting of the Omer. And if anyone has the Omer app, and uh, would like to share the meditation with us, or if you have Rabbi Trugman's book and would like to share, uh, please feel free after we count. So I'm going to put the Omer count on the screen, and then we will get underway. All right. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotah V'Tivanu Aos Firat HaOmer. Today is 46 days, which is six weeks and four days of the Omer. May the merciful one restore unto us the service of the Beit HaMikdash to its place speedily in our days. Amen. Selah. For the choir master, a song with instrumental music, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his countenance shine upon us forever. That your way be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. The nations will extol you, O God. All the nations will extol you. The nations will rejoice and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples justly and guide the nations on earth forever. The peoples will extol you, O God. All the peoples will extol you, for the earth will have yielded its produce, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us and all from the farthest corners of the earth shall fear him. We implore you by the great power of your right hand, release the captive, accept the prayer of your people, strengthen us, purify us, awesome one, mighty one, we beseech you, guard as the apple of the eye, those who see your oneness. Bless them, cleanse them, bestow upon them forever your merciful righteousness, powerful holy one, and your abounding goodness. Guide your congregation. Only an exalted one, turn to your people who are mindful of your holiness. Accept our supplication and hear our cry. 
you who know secret thoughts. Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. Master of the universe, you have commanded us through Moshe, your servant, to count Spirat HaOmer in order to purify us from our evil and uncleanness. As you have written in your Torah, you shall count for yourselves from the day following the day of rest, from the day on which you bring the Omer as a wave offering. The counting shall be for seven full weeks until the day following the seventh week shall you count 50 days so that the souls of your people, Yisrael, may be cleansed from their defilement. Therefore, may it be your will, Adonai our God, and the God of our forefathers, that in the merit of the Spirat HaOmer, which I counted today, that the blemish I have caused in the Spirat of Netzach Sheb Malkut be rectified, and I may be purified and sanctified with supernal holiness. May abundant bounty thereby be bestowed upon all the worlds. May it rectify our nefesh, ruach, and neshama from every baseness and defect. And may it purify and sanctify us with your supernal holiness. Amen. Selah. Mashiach now. All right. Would anybody like to share any uh, Omer meditations or anything? Yep, for sure. All right, what you got? <clears throat> and again, it is 46 days, which are six weeks and four days of the Omer. That talk of Malkut, victory within kingship, trust, confidence within lowliness. <clears throat> God will reign for all eternity. Exodus 15, 18. Trust in God forever, for in God is the rock of eternity. Isaiah 26, 4. For the king, trust in God and in the loving kindness of the Most High, that he should not falter. Psalm 21, 8. David was in dire straits, but, David's, but David strengthened himself in God, his God. First Shmuel 30, verse 6. And on this 46th day of the Omer, Moshe ascended Mount Sinai in preparation for the receiving of the Torah. Crusaders massacred the Jewish community of Neus, Prussia, in 1096. Israel captured uh, Quinitra, Syria, and the Golan Heights in 1967. Spiritual meditations for the day. Every person has their own personal challenges and trials. This is, of course, especially true with those who take on leadership positions. The difference between success and failure in many cases rests on one's ability to stand up to pressure. Only those who have confidence in themselves and the righteousness of their cause have the steadfastness to stand up to any and every test. Yet, ultimately, Judaism teaches self-confidence can only go so far without true reliance and trust in God. Far from being a sign of weakness, trusting in God gives a person incredible strength to persevere and be victorious. Knowing that God stands with us through everything is one of the most comforting feelings we can have as we wade through the waters of life. Netzach and Malkut is an awesome time to reign and strengthen our innate sense of self-worth, while at the same time fortifying our faithful trust in the master of the universe. King David was challenged throughout his life, and though he did not lack self-confidence, he appealed to God for his assistance in every situation. The Psalms of David reflect the pinnacles of triumph as well as the depths of despair, and yet, through it all, David constantly and consistently expresses his ultimate trust in God. Questions of the day. How do I deal with adversity when it comes my way? Am I able to reach out to God and ask for assistance when needed? How can I tap into my own inner strengths in order to overcome challenges? What is the appropriate balance of self-reliance and trust in God? Which side of that coin do I find myself on most often? How can I more properly balance out that equation in my approach to life? 
And those are the historical events and the spiritual meditation for the day. Um, one other thing I've been doing is I've been reading from Mashilat Yesharim. Beautiful. Especially with uh, Pure Kea Vote. Um, it, it goes without saying the, the weekly parsha and our, our daily prayers. You know, one of the, the cool things about, you know, the, the prayers that we recite constantly is always being able to look at them with new eyes and to really hone in on a particular line or a particular verse of any of the prayers that you recite. And for me, this week has been uh, Psalm 145, where it talks about close to Hashem are those who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. You know, and it's just been like a wave for me being in the, the whole Geula mindset and mentality, you know, of desiring the whole entire world to really know who they are in Hashem, which is really amazing. Each of us are a spark of Hashem. That means like literally when all of us are gathered together, we get to see Hashem, you know? And it's like finding that peace in us that that's our true being, our true self, you know? And that gets covered up a lot by, you know, things that we're not able to do and, you know, things that we wish we could do, you know, things we're frustrated or excited about, you know, all these things. But anyway, that's just uh, something really cool with this week of Malkut, that as we're going through all these aspects, this is where it really gets down to like, really who we are, you know, what are we doing with ourself, you know, in the aspects of, you know, when it boils down to all that we receive, all that we've been through, what are we going to do with it? Which is cool that you think about the ascension of the Mashiach. He left us by ourselves to count this last week of the Omer. So with that, I know you got messed a lot, your Shireen, so please keep going. Yeah, when you were talking there, I was just reminded of this week's rumination since I have the opportunity. Um, the focus of redemption is not individuals, but community. We are redeemed into a community. Yes, salvation may seem on the surface an individual act, but what are we brought into? This is one of the core teachings of Judaism. Love you're in you're brought into a community of people that will support you that will be there but at the same time you'll be held accountable i mean you know when you do something out out of bounds um you know individuals are redeemed but individual redemption should never be seen as the good news we are meant to be part of a redeemed community the message of the good news is often presented to individuals outside the redeemed community because it is laudable endeavor, biblical faith is often viewed as personal faith, quote unquote. While it is true that personal faith exhibited in personal obedience is a hallmark of the believer, it can lead to some, it can lead some to think that redemption is all about the individual. The Torah is about community. It was given in the presence of an entire nation, after all. That's right. Um, well, most of the commandments of the Torah are in the Hebrew plural, not the singular. We have not been called into an individual relationship with God. We have been personally and intimately called into a relationship that is best described as a family, which is the point you were making all along. Yes, sir. And that family is called Israel. Yes. To be absolutely brothers, clear. Sisters, aunts, uncles. Yes. There are not <laughs> two assemblies or two distinct peoples of God. There is only one. Beautiful. Shaul makes this point in Romans 11 and Ephesians 2. He is very clear on this. To Some Messianics have a problem with this, and I've noticed it over the years. And this is where they run into trouble, well, especially when it comes to the performance of mitzvot, because what you're really doing is you're excluding yourself from the community. This, this one community that Hashem has called out of exile to serve him. 
Beautiful. So you have a message like Yashirin? Yep, I'm on chapter 20, and I've been sharing this with uh, some other people on the, uh, with Izzy Abraham's tribe group on a regular basis. Okay. Um, but this is assessing piety, chapter 20. What needs to be explained at this point is how to assess the nature of this kind of piety. This is a matter of the highest importance. You should be aware that in actuality, this is the most difficult aspect of piety because of the subtleties involved. And the evil inclination readily finds an opening into this domain. Therefore, one finds himself on very dangerous ground here, for there are many good things that the evil inclination may reject as if they were harmful and many sins that it may turn into important mitzvahs. In reality, man must fulfill three requirements to succeed in this assessment. He must have the most truthful of hearts. In other words, you've got to be willing to turn that microscope inward and allow yourself to be seen, to be transparent before Hashem. Because he sees everything. He knows the hidden things. I mean, what are we praying in Anabekoa? You know the secret thoughts. Yeah. Can't hide from them. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, inside of my front cover of my Sudur, know before whom you stand. The king who reigns over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. But that doesn't cause a person to shudder, man. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do people today tremble at his word like they did at the giving of the Torah? Wow. Considering that Rashi tells us that we're supposed to accept the Torah every day as if we're standing at the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to check master plan here real quick to uh, let everyone know that when you, uh, if you wanted to study, you know, Shavuot, uh, some of the things that we have here is found in, uh, let's see, page 205 and page 183, which correspond to, which actually it's, it's funny because last year we kind of went over this. So, uh, but it's always good to refresh that uh, it's chapter 43. And also chapter chapter 47. So if you look at those two chapters, you can get a little bit more on uh, Shavuot information. So as I wanted to share from the Midrash Rabbah, this will be our closing point for tonight. This is such a beautiful Midrash. What just happened? <laughs> that is, uh, hopefully I can find it now. I was only looking at one page, now it's two. Okay, cool. Let's see. So this is in Parsha Naso. And this is talking about, uh, see, I don't really know what it's talking It's in the verse, there's a passage about a person who sins and all this kind of stuff. So right here, I think, yeah, this is where I'm going to start. So it says, O house of those that fear Hashem, but you that fear Hashem, for these do not constitute a father's house, but have voluntarily come forward and loved the Holy One, blessed be he. The Holy One, blessed be he, therefore loves them. And for this reason, it says, the Lord loves the righteous, etc. The Holy One, blessed be he, greatly loves the proselytes. To what may this be compared? To a king who had a flock, which used to go out to the field and come in at even. So it was each day, once a stag came in with the flock, he associated with the goats and grazed with them. I want to point out that Shlomo just mentioned about people who exclude themselves from the community because they reject the mitzvot. 
the stag that comes in, he associates with the goats and grazes with them. So continuing on, it says, when the flock came into the fold, he came in with them. When they went out to graze, he went out with them. The king was told, a certain stag has joined the flock and is grazing with them every day. He goes out with them and comes in with them. The king felt an affection for him. When he went out into the field, the king gave orders, let him have good pasture, such as he likes. No man shall beat him. Be careful with him. And they're bringing down Shoker Tove. They also say uh, the good shepherd. They say, let him have good pasture, such as he likes. No man shall beat him. Be careful with him. When he came in with the flock, also the king would tell them, give him to drink. And he loved him very much. The servants said to him, sovereign, you possess so many he goats. You possess so many lambs. You possess so many kids and you never caution us about them. Yet you give us instructions every day about this stag, said the king to them. The flock have no choice, whether they want or not. It is their nature to graze in the field all day and to come in at even to sleep in the fold. The stags, however, sleep in the wilderness. It is not in their nature to come into places inhabited by man. Shall we then not account it as a merit to this one, which has left behind the whole of the broad, vast wilderness, the abode of all the beasts, and has come to stay in the courtyard? In like manner, Ought we not to be grateful to the proselyte who has left behind him, his family, and his father's house? I has left behind his people and all the other peoples of the world and has chosen to come to us accordingly. He has provided him with a special protection, for he exhorted Israel that they shall be very careful in relation to the proselytes so as not to do to them harm. And so indeed it says, love you therefore the proselyte, etc. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. But this is just a, a beautiful midrash to teach us, you know, really what we're entering into uh, at Shabbat is the, it's like the anniversary of proselytes coming into the nation. You know, when it says that Yitro heard, and then he came to, to meet the encampment of Israel, like, it's like, what did Yitro hear? Well, he heard about the sea, he heard about the battle against Amalek. And he heard about this nation that left Mitzrayim, like all these beautiful things. And so when people want to come join and they're really sincere about it, you know, we really need to take stock of that as far as what the mentors brought down. And uh, it just behooves me to look up what a stag is and, and just see a picture of it. Oh, my gosh. OK, so I'm going to put this on the screen. Could you imagine you just got sheep and goats and you see this? <laughs> like, I don't know if everybody can see this, but I'm going to open the image in a new time. Look at this. This is a stag. You want to talk about <laughs> sticking out, right? <laughs> so. This midrash that we just brought down was really just showing us that, yeah, as proselytes, you might stick out. You may not feel like you fit, but hey, it's time to go in. It's time to come out. It's time to graze in the field. All these beautiful things. 
and we're determined to be there. Stags are like, they're scared of people. It's like, you see them on the road, they run away or they run into your car, you know, or, you know, these kinds of things like, but you're going to come in the courtyard. You're going to like go and be like domesticated. Like what, you know, Hashem is like, please, by all means. So Bezrat Hashem, that's encouraging for us. And uh, we will end with the blessing uh, after studying Torah. Found on page 143 in your Siddur. Thank you for tuning in tonight. We did divert from schedule, but I wanted uh, to take some time to share sources on Ruth, get us ready for Shavuot, and uh, just to bring out some things to, to encourage us during these times. Every day is a challenge. And what Shlomo just read, may we take it to heart because that is some strength right there. Shlomo, Todaraba, I really appreciate it. All Good right. <laughs> and the blessing for study or after we study Torah. Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Natan Lanu Torat Emet, Vekaye Olam Nata Betokenu. Baruk Ata Adonai Notain Ha Torah. Mashiach now. Lala Tov, everyone, and Shavuot <laughs>